Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Refactoring UI. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at an example provided by my friend, Justin Jackson. Justin and his partner, John Buda, are building Transistor, a platform to host all of your podcasts on. It's a really great tool to manage your shows and grow your audience. I actually have a few friends who use Transistor for their podcasts and all they have to say is great things about it. So I was really happy to take a look at the design to see how it can be improved. Now, overall design-wise, I think this is off to a good start, especially considering it's just a two-man team and neither of them have a design background. So bravo to them for what they've already produced. But I was taking a look at a few pages within their app and the integrations page jumped out at me as a good example to consider making a few tweaks to. I thought there were a lot of quick wins on here that would clean this page up and bring it to that next level. But one thing I plan to keep in mind when refactoring this page is that it's on a bit of a template that's shared with other pages. I really don't want to make major global changes without considering how they're going to affect other pages. So before we get into some of the page level changes, let's explore a few of the small global changes. So one thing I did notice that could be fixed on all of the pages is the page width. At the moment, this design has a max width of 1127 pixels, resulting in an excessively long reading width with long form inputs and a significant amount of wasted space on some of the pages. So we're going to reduce the max width. Anything between 960 and 1024 should suffice. Okay, that helps a bit, but in addition to that, we can also bump up the font size to better maximize that space. At the moment, it looks like most things are using a base font size of 14 pixels. So most of the time, I work with a base font size of 16, as in one rem or m unit is equal to 16 pixels, and work around that to define my hierarchy. As we increase the overall font size, we may want to increase the vertical space between elements. So I'm going to bump up the margins and padding on the header section, and we'll touch on some of the other elements as we make our way through the page. Okay, another global change we may want to take a look at is the grays, specifically the color gray used for text and background elements. So right now, there is a little bit of inconsistency with how the grays are being used. For example, in some cases, the grays used in the headings and the background color are saturated with a bit of blue for a cooler look, which I encourage. But in other cases, the grays used on elements like the paragraph text and borders are black with reduced opacity. This results in a differently perceived gray depending on the background it sits on. So if some text sits on a light gray and slightly saturated background, it's going to look different than the gray that is directly on the white background. For this reason, I like to have a fixed palette of solid colors to choose from, something I define up front. I like to work with nine to 10 grays. This gives me enough range so I can use them for both light and dark mode. Lately, I've been relying on the grays and many other colors that come with Tailwind CSS's default palette. Now, I recognize that I am totally biased as I pick these colors, but I spent a ton of time picking them and using them. I find they are great for a starting point, and I think it's worth noting that the grays 600 to 900 are accessible on white, and grays 100 to 600 are accessible on black. So I'm going to apply these grays to the transistor UI. And these grays by default are saturated with a bit of blue, like some of the current transistor grays. Okay, so the last global change we're going to make is a subtle one in the horizontal navigation at the top. So at the moment, it's using a combination of color and weight to put emphasis on the active state. This does certainly help to highlight it a bit, but one of the problems with using a bolder weight to highlight the active state is that it causes subtle shifting when navigating from one page to the next. So to avoid this, I would just give every link the same weight and use color alone to emphasize the active state. Okay, so now that we've made a few global changes that aren't overly destructive, let's see what can be done to this page itself. Okay, so even though we reduce the max width of the page and increase the base font size, the reading width on this page description text is still a little bit too much. We could simply reduce that by making this text block smaller, but that does look a bit odd when it doesn't share the same width as every other container on the page. So another way to decrease the reading width is by increasing the size of the text. So we're going to bump that up to 18 pixels. 
Now, unfortunately, this results in the text stealing a lot of attention because as the size increases, it takes up more of the surface area, resulting in increased contrast. So we can combat that by reducing the color contrast to a lighter but still accessible gray. Let's also take a look at how we can clean up the appearance of the content in these panels. You know, like right now, nothing really lines up making it tricky to scan. A lot of common elements like inputs and buttons are positioned in different places on the y-axis, preventing an efficient flow. Now, since all these panels share a lot of the same type of content, I want to try to fix one and carry those changes where I can to the other panels. So to start, I want to take a look at a more complex one and see how those changes are transferable. So taking a quick look at this, I would say that the YouTube auto posting panel has the most complex layout. I figure if I can solve the problems on this one, I should be able to easily solve the problems on the rest. So let's start with that. One way to clean up a design and make it look 10 times better is alignment, specifically alignment of text. And right now, this icon is really throwing everything off. But it's also a nice visual cue making it more scannable. It would be nice to actually bring more attention to it. So to do that, we're going to indent all the text so it's on the same scan line. And that helps a bit, but I think it would be nice to draw even more attention to this icon. So we could do that by increasing the size, but I find blowing up simple icons like this always looks clunky and unprofessional. So a great way to make the icon appear larger without actually making it bigger is to contain it in a shape, like a circle. Not only does this draw more attention to it, but it also unifies the icon with other section icons nicely. And since we bumped up the relative size of the body text, we're going to increase the size of the title. This also makes it so it's more proportionate to the icon that we just modified to the left. And since we increased the font size of all of these elements, much like we did with the elements in the header, we're going to increase the line heights, margins, and padding, so they are more proportionate to the font size. Next, let's take a look at the connected channel information. So we have two buttons displayed here. Wait, that's not a button. That's a label and a title. Hmm. Okay, well, let's make it more apparent that this is in fact not a button. So first we're going to remove the button styling and give this more of a title treatment by increasing the size. Now this label is still useful, but we're going to de-emphasize it with size and weight and color so it's not taking away from the title itself. Now one thing that I almost overlooked is that this title is in fact a text link that navigates to the connected YouTube channel but it's not super clear on the old design nor the new design we're working on. So we're going to add an icon that is commonly used to indicate when something is an external link. And this title, it's pretty important, arguably more important than the title of this section. But right now it's competing for attention because they're both using a large and bold font. So let's reduce the weight of this section title to balance things out a bit. Okay, that's looking much cleaner. Now this disconnect button, might be a tad too attention grabbing for such a high severity action. A common problem I see with developer designs is that they always make destructive actions red, but semantics should be a secondary consideration. If the destructive action isn't the primary action on the page, it might be better to give it a secondary or tertiary button treatment. So in this case, we're going to de-emphasize it by changing the color to a soft gray. Now, we still want it to appear clickable, so we're going to increase the weight and put an icon I found on material icons next to it. This manages to make it a bit more subtle while still appearing clickable. Finally, let's distance it from the title to avoid accidental disconnection by moving it to the far right. Now, making this change helps to give it a comfortable proximity from the title link, but it now feels like it's just floating there. So we're going to add a light border to better associate it with the title. Okay, so the addition of this border is nice because it plays an important role of associating the elements, but it begins to clutter the design, especially because there is another border dividing the page description and the channel title. Too many borders like this can make a design look busy, but a great way to create separation between two elements is to give adjacent elements slightly different background colors. So we're going to make this bottom section a subtle off-white, as well as increase the space to define the sections a bit better. 
Additionally, I'm going to remove the border around this section container. It already has a box shadow on it, and usually that with a combination of a darker background is enough to create distinction, eliminating the need for a border. Okay, moving on. So as you can see here, we have a preview card to the left and the channel settings on the right. That might be fine for this, but if you go further up the page to the mailing list section, you'll see that it has an input of its own. So it would be nice to keep all the form elements aligned as you scroll down the page to give you a nice flow. So to do that, we're going to flip the preview card and the inputs. Let's also maximize the space by splitting these elements 50-50 within the allocated space. Now, we've been talking a lot about increasing the overall space to the layout, making it more proportionate to the font size, as well as give the elements additional room to breathe. But we also need to consider this for individual components like inputs and buttons. So we're going to bump up the height of those. I like to be generous with elements like this, somewhere between an overall height of 40 and 48 pixels should suffice. I'm also going to remove the uppercase formatting on these labels to make them a bit more legible. Additionally, I'm going to make the border two pixels so it shares the same width as borders used elsewhere on the design. This ultimately makes it look darker and heavier, so we're also going to soften the color to balance it out with the surrounding design. Okay, next thing we want to take a look at are these button colors. In terms of semantics, I suppose this might seem like the right approach with the green save button indicating success and the gray button as a secondary treatment. But as we already discussed, semantics are secondary to hierarchy. And hierarchy wise, this image upload button stands out way more than the save button. Furthermore, the white text on this green button isn't accessible. I usually like to use my brand color for primary actions. Now in this case, the brand color is yellow, which is often associated with warning. But Transistor also heavily uses a dark gray, something that's really close to black within their brand palette. And I think dark gray is perfectly acceptable to use for primary actions. I often resort to that when my brand colors are associated with destructive actions like red or yellow. And to give the image button a secondary treatment, we're going to invert it. So use a soft gray for the background and a dark color for the icon and text. Let's also move this help text over so it's associated with the action so users can easily find it when they're about to upload an image. Okay, and this preview card is looking pretty good, but I think we should add a label to it so it's a bit clear what we're looking at. We're almost done with this section, but we still have this bottom message to deal with. Now this message is saying that it initiated the posting of all the previous episodes to YouTube. And then it just stays there, which might be a bit unnecessary after everything is uploaded. It might be more useful if this was emphasized a bit more once the channel first gets connected and then disappears after all the episodes are processed. So to make it pop more, we're going to move it below the channel title and contain it in a neutral colored alert style. Now I want to use a neutral color style because it's not necessarily a positive or a negative alert. Now one thing that I've observed is that most developers would style their alert messages using a dark background with white text. But sometimes it's hard to work with those colors and still achieve accessible contrast ratios. I find a nice way to treat these alerts is to make the background a soft color with dark text. This is easy to accomplish by using the predefined palette like we're doing with the grays. So in this case, once again, I'm going to use the Tailwind CSS defaults. Finally, let's take a look at this completion status located on the top left. So I really like this treatment, but like the white text on a green button, this check has the same problem of being difficult to see. So once again, we're going to invert this using a lighter green for the background and a dark green for the check. Okay, so I think this section is looking pretty good. It's looking much cleaner. So let's apply some of these changes to the other sections. So just to recap, we're going to align the text elements and make space for the icon that we're going to contain in a circle. We're also going to apply the same text and spacing treatments and redesign this title disconnect section. Okay, we're getting really close here. Now on this mailing list section, we have another save button. Now the first thing we want to do is style it so it's consistent with the other primary button on the page. But I also want to reconsider the position of it. Now even on the bottom here, my first instinct was to right align the button. 
That's where I typically put buttons on forms. And I think it's important to always have the form submit buttons in the same position. At a previous employer of mine, we did some testing on both the left and the right and concluded that it didn't matter where the button was positioned, as long as it's in the same spot everywhere within the application. But I was still unsure of this, so I took the conversation to Twitter, and most of the replies said to right align the button, which I almost proceeded with. But then I was informed that right aligning the button posed some accessibility issues. Now this comment made some sense to me, but I would have to do some additional research before I agreed this is the best solution in all scenarios. This would also be a global change, and I would hate to commit to something like this without confirming all the cases. But for the sake of this video, I went with my gut and decided to left align the button so it sits below the forms. Regardless, I think it's worth visiting this thread on Twitter as well as a few others that I brought up during the creation of this video, as there's a really great discussion surrounding this topic, so I'll be sure to link these below in the description. Finally, I'm just going to update the style of this Spotify link so it's consistent with every other link on this page, and that pretty much wraps everything up. So let's just compare our starting point with the design we landed on. Okay, so thanks for checking out the video. I hope you liked it. I just wanted to share one thing. So recently I launched an ebook and video course with my friend Adam Wavin. It's pretty much everything we know about designing for the web packed into a single comprehensive resource. It comes with 50 chapters of no fluff content, three fast paced videos packed with tips and how to apply them to real world examples. The complete package also comes with great resources, including beautiful color palettes, font recommendations, a component gallery if you're looking for layout ideas and need some inspiration. Plus, there's a set of 200 icons that you can customize for your projects. We're really proud of this package. It's something we wish existed when we were just starting out. So if you want to learn how to design beautiful UIs, I think it's definitely worth checking out. And it's also a great way to support the YouTube channel if you like these videos. So you can find a link for that in the description. So thanks again for checking out the video and we'll see you again real soon.